Welcome back to the channel, guys. I have a very special guest on today. Can't see who he is, but he is XO, Trader XO, uh, a friend from the UK, a uh, Twitter space, great trader out there. And today we want to go through and just discuss what our views are of the market. Um, XO and I have chatted quite a bit offline and we see the market in, I guess we could say different lights. We have different opinions on the market itself. But as you would know, I love to get people on with different opinions so that we can keep a balanced uh, view of, of the markets so that potentially we can review, uh, remove some of the, the biases that we may have. Um, so Trader XO, I'll let you say hi and introduce yourself because this will be going on to XO's channel as well. And the links will all be in the video description to go and follow XO on YouTube and on Twitter. So yeah, it's uh, it's good to uh, finally catch up with you. It's been a while. I think we've tried to plan this a few times and uh, here we are. We first met on Twitter Spaces um, and uh, had, yeah, some really fascinating uh, conversations back and forth about the economy, the housing market, mm -hmm. and uh, overall just general crypto, I guess, uh, you know, there's there's quite a divided opinion out there, whether we're bullish or bearish. But I think uh, all shall be uncovered in today's uh, stream. So uh, fascinating one. Certainly, uh, you've got your views and I've got my views. And uh, let's see where we are at the end of the stream. Indeed. And that's what got me interested to chat with you because of how well we could communicate with each other, even though we had very differing uh, opinions. I think that's what first stood out on that um, that first Twitter spaces. And, you know, we we both got along and asked a lot of questions to each other. I think our views align there. I think I use trading, cryptocurrencies, global markets, trading, where I thoroughly enjoy it. I actually love trading, but really looking to monopolize and gain from the markets. Uh, and I think crypto offers that opportunity. If you know what you're doing, there's some serious upside to be made as long as you can protect the downsides. Um, and yeah, just like yourself, eventually taking that cash flow and looking to invest in in businesses, in properties that generate yield uh, and having real assets under your name. So, yeah, I, I, it's for me, I think trading is a, is, a, is a means. You know, previously I was a software developer for 10, 12 years and I've been a trader for seven years. And looking back, it's probably one of the best decisions I've made, one of the most painful, emotional roller coasters I've been on. But uh, I wouldn't give it up for anything else right now. I think that's one of our major similarities is that we can appreciate what the markets have taught us, even when we were wrong. And of course, the better times is when we were right, or at least making profits. Um, I think that's what, you know, how, how we get along so well. Um, do you want to crack on with the macro view? We'll start, oh, it's basically what we're doing here, guys, is just a bit of a general overview, a chat together. Uh, where I'm going to go through and I want to understand XO's view of the market, the macro view going from Bitcoin, cryptos, and of course the economy. And um, you know, along the way, basically throw it backwards and forwards. But if you want to start with that, mate, I see your charts up there. I'll just add it. Yeah, sure. So it's, it's fascinating. You know, we saw credit tightening occur towards the end of 2021. We saw the Fed was talking about tapering, then talking about rate hikes. And lo and behold, one year later, we've gone through one of the most aggressive rate hike policies ever by a Fed. We've seen other central banks around the globe tighten their policy. Um, so, you know, I think what we saw in 2022 was a brutal market, especially in the crypto space with Bitcoin tr coming all the way back down to 15K, uh, 15K levels, all coins really Massive drawdowns around about 80 to 90 percent. Some altcoins are still holding up relatively okay considering where they were in 2020, 2021. But for me, ultimately, you know, Jason, I still believe that there could potentially be more pain ahead to towards the second half of the year. But does that necessarily mean that we that, that I'm bearish? No, I think um with any recessionary environment, if we are heading into a recession, which I believe we will, uh Obviously, I'll cover that in the stream today. But at the end of the day, I look at the business cycle. The business cycle is made up of GDP, CPI, and government policy, which is monetary and fiscal policy. We've seen how inflation has risen dramatically, not just in America, but in Europe as well. We've seen growth of late slowing down, especially in the US economy. But all this has been driven essentially by the Fed monetary and fiscal policy. We saw a rapid rate of quantitative easing throughout 2020 post-COVID into 2021, which really, I think, exacerbated uh, inflation 
And now, we've, after having seen one of the most aggressive rate hike policies to curb inflation, I still believe that there is risks, major risks ahead because what we've seen in the first half of this downward cycle is rate hikes. But I think we're likely to see the credit tightening lag effects in the second half, the second half of the market where we could see earnings recession start occurring, which would have a, a further effect on, on stocks and equities. The question is, how does Bitcoin survive in that environment? But ultimately, I still think there is more pain to the downside. But is that a reason to be bearish? Not in my opinion, because I think now I'm looking at the next six to nine months as where do I want to start buying back into the market? What's a really good value area for me to start buying back into the market? And again, looking at this chart here, you can see once we're heading to a recession, obviously that's generally the trough, but with, with how markets perform, markets are generally forward looking by, you know, approximately six months time. So by the time the recession is fully here, I think the market will have bottomed well before that. And it's probably a good opportunity to really start increasing risk on appetite. Um, so yeah, this is something that we can talk about in today's macro views, and and I'll probably talk about four points that I look at. When you say buy back into the market, just so we're all clear, which markets are you mostly focused on to buy back into? So in my opinion, I think there's going to be some great opportunities, not in just cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, but really looking at global markets, some of the equities. I think it's just a matter of understanding the sector rotations out there when is a good time to maybe get exposure back into bonds maybe when does one cycle out of bonds into value stocks with versus growth stocks Looking do you put all those, these things into your portfolio i will be yes because this is something okay. that i've something that i've prepared for um you know in the seven years that i've been trading i've never really held a portfolio in global markets simply because of the fact that i felt everything was overvalued now, for the first time since GFC, 15 years later, this is a golden opportunity to once again pick up stocks, pick up ETFs, pick up shares that are really smashed or probably will likely to continue to bleed, in my opinion, towards the second half of the year. Um, as an investor, that, that's a great time for me to really start looking for good value investments and looking for those sector rotation plays. So I'm, essentially, I will be running a portfolio, a, a tactical portfolio, which is kind of a month-to-month -month basis, you know, trying to take advantage of the shorter-term cyclical nature of the markets. But then you've got your your longer-term investment portfolio, which, you know, it depends what happens. I guess, you know, five years is a long time to stay invested into the markets. For me, I'm more of a cyclical player. If the market rallies and we see signs of weakness, then for, for me, that is a reason to start taking profit. I'm not somebody who generally looks to hold all the way back down. Um, mm. and primarily, that's where my trading instincts come into play is either I'm going to hedge or I'm going to take profit. But ultimately, you know, when I look at the bigger picture, it's uh, I think we, we are heading in towards some really fantastic buying opportunities, uh, or I hope that we will see those in the next 6 to 12 months. I'll just say uh, apologies to the viewers of XO, so your, your viewers on your end. If I interrupt, I mean, I'm just trying to watch the the sound waves on your icon and see where I can jump in. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm more of a talking, but you know, some people want to stay anonymous, and that's that's your that's your gig. And I appreciate that. Sure. Um, so I just want to. I know some people say that like, why do you keep cutting in? It's like, all right, chill out, guys. Um, so in terms of the uh, the macro side here, uh, another another big question I usually ask is, if you're expecting further downside, just to get some clear levels, because um, you know, not saying you, but some others don't have these clear level, clearer levels. Are you expecting for the S&P 500, the US market, uh, for the low in October of 2022 to be taken out, the 3,500 point low? I think when I'm in this game, I'm not really looking at it in a way that I believe that equities or Bitcoin can print new lows. That's not really my concern. My concern is more probabilistic. Looking at the probabilities out there, I think the probability is skewed to if one has too much risk exposure, then they may find themselves in a position of being uncomfortable for the next several months, especially if earning recession kicks in and, and, the, and the lag effects of credit tightening kick in, then, you know, we could see a significant drawdown in the markets from this point onwards. Does that necessarily mean that equities will print a new low? Maybe, but e even if we do, I think it's, it's not going to be too drastically too low down, further down. But for me, it's all about timing. 
the next cyclical wave to the upside. And if you look at equities markets, you know, there's been so much noise on Twitter, on social media. Mm. Um, you know, equities are going to retire. You've got the bear crowd, which equities are going to go to 29, 28. All we've done is just range, trade in a range, in a macro range. It's been a brilliant trading environment for, for those of us who trade, which I do. But as an investor, good Lord, you, you're probably getting chopped up and, you know, you, you're trying to position yourself and price isn't going anywhere and there's all this fear and then the other crowd is talking about new highs are going to come in equities in the next six months. Nothing's happened. It's just a range. It's a, it's a phase of consolidation where I think the market is hesitant about what's going to come next. And looking at the probabilities, I think the probabilities are, let's be honest, if growth is slowing down, inflation remains sticky, and the Fed monetary fiscal policy remains higher for longer, that's really going to have an effect on the economy. And like they say, nothing really kills the rece- nothing really kills inflation like a recession. So maybe the Fed does over-tighten and induce a recession, and maybe that's where it may take. But again, that's, that's a brilliant buying opportunity heading into that downturn. And what would you have to see for the market? What would you want to see in the market? What do you want to see it do? If October was the low and where we're holding up in prices, talking, you know, stock markets here, if we're holding, as we're holding up in prices, uh, markets start to head higher. Like what would you do? How would that then indicate or dictate what you do next in positioning your portfolio if October is the low, you know, October 2022? I, I think even if the market... And we don't re- see this recession. Sorry. Yeah, I think at that point, I think, to be honest with you, you have to be open-minded to the possibility that we may not see a recession, I think is extremely low probability. I think all the Fed's talk of a soft landing is pretty much fading away now. I think the consensus is that the hard landing scenario is a real prospect. However, many people anticipated a recession uh, in, in, towards, you know, end of last year, they thought, yep, Q1 2023 or Q2 2023, we're going to receive a recession. Clearly, that's not the case because the US economy, the GDP, the economy is holding up for quite well due to wage inflation pressures. Wage inflation is causing inflation to stay sticky, especially in services and services PMI. So looking at the data there, um, the Fed's got a real task of battling inflation. And it could be a case where, well, if inflation ticks up higher, in the next uh, month or two, what does the Fed do at that point? Do they do they then hike another 25 and another 25 after that? And do they remain uh, at 5.5%, knowing that the Fed wants to target 2%, which isn't likely to happen anytime soon, unless there's a big uh, black swan event or a recession is induced. It, it's a real battle in the Fed's hand. So, you know, it's, it's a question of, well, if the markets do go higher at this point, I still believe it's just a trading opportunity not one that I'd be looking to invest. I think uh, these cycles can take time to play out. Re- heading into a recession, I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. It could take six months. It could be uh, 2024 Q1. So as a trader or as an investor, I just want to be cautious that once shit hits the fan, then great. Because you know what? Because I know now that the downside risk is, is very, very limited. And the probability of the upside is now increased. It's kind of like a a max opportunity time to be in the markets, if that happens. Um, So looking at the data, I think there's a good chance it it could happen. So we're we're all kind of waiting for a recession or basically like that clear out uh, where the markets tank so we can have a reset like we saw with Bitcoin. You know, it's, it's dumped to 15K and you say, well, the downside, although limited, um, isn't that big of a deal, but the upside is is much much uh, looks much better. Whereas for the stock market, you know, it's come down a fair bit. It came down uh, what from thirty forty eight hundred to thirty five hundred, so whatever the percentage is there. Uh, and I guess people were expecting more, but we're starting to see it climb a little bit here. I think we're both on the same page where we expect something to collapse. Like there's got to be some sort of flush out soon. The only thing that I see different when it comes to uh, a more macro bearish view of the of the overall environment compared to say mine is which is a bit more bullish to the upside just just in the the stock markets is in terms of the timing so you know i still see we got a little bit longer to go and then we get a major collapse whereas some of the other guys maybe yourself you know your views are you're probably expecting that collapse this year or, or next year yeah that's that's right jason and the, the reasons behind my views is that if you just look at this chart here that i've put together mm-hmm. The green line is the growth is growth GDP. 
the blue line is inflation. This was back in 2001. When inflation, or when essentially when growth is slowing down, that's often a risk of environment. Okay, for stocks to perform well, they perform well when growth is growth is is expanding or is above a certain level. Growth was sliding down a cliff along with inflation. Equity market slides lower. Okay, now where I've marked out the red zone, that was the 2001 recession. The green zone essentially marks out the turning point in growth when growth is ticking up again. You can see equities pauses, makes a bottom, continues higher. We have a sustained period of growth at three to four percent GDP in two, in in the mid two thousands. And again, what happened in late two thousand seven, early two thousand eight? Growth falls off a cliff. The stock market also falls off a cliff. This was the GFC crisis, okay? And again, when growth starts ticking up, the stock market ticks up. When growth is healthy at three four percent. The stock market is too well. This here was a COVID crash, flash crash, and again, an aggressive overstimulation in terms of QE caused. Look at the look at growth spiking, and it caused many many markets out there to really go parabolic, including Bitcoin from three k to sixty nine k in the space of 12, 15 months. Growth slowed down in April twenty twenty one. Started rolling over. Equities started contracting even lower down. But yet growth is still holding at this level here, which which is showing signs that the US economy is still resolute. It's still fairly strong, uh, driven by the fact that wage inflation is having a, a having effect on services, which is causing services to remain sticky in terms of its inflation. And, and therefore, the Fed's got a real battle in the hands. Uh, as you can see, inflation has been coming down, but it's sticking at that 5% level, which is still considerably high. So the question is, there's many people out there saying that the Fed needs to stop, the Fed needs to pause, the Fed needs to um, start cutting rates. How can they cut rates if, if if inflation is not really coming down to 2 or 3%, it's still stuck at 5%? Surely if they start cutting rates, isn't that going to cause inflation to probably spike and have a have a case what we saw in the 70s where if the Fed cuts too early, well, we get a double dose of inflation. Uh, and that is going to be a really, a really, really big, big problem considering how... Uh, difficult inflation is and the impact it has on on prices and, and given the fact that we've we've seen credit tightening occur right so if credit tightening is occurring banks are going to be more stringent in terms of how much credit they're going to lend to consumers to businesses um, credit facilitation will reduce over the coming months that then will cause a real slowdown in the economy and again we'll probably see growth sliding further lower down which takes me onto the onto the next slide. But I don't know if you have any questions there. What your thoughts are there, Jude? Yeah, when it came to the banking stuff, that was I think that was one point that we first started talking about when we we first met all those weeks ago. Um, when um, what I was explaining about the real estate cycle, which is something we can we can come to later, but looking at this part of the this cycle as as I'm seeing it, as we're still heading up rather than down, um, we may not get this you know this recession that the the government has to to talk about the government has to say the words we we saw the technical recession last year like we all we all know that the first and second yeah. quarter of 2022 so maybe this time i'm not saying this time is different by no way <laughs> i'm not saying is it different yeah. we got the rhyme where we had the recession but this time we don't have the the um you know the recession that the fed actually uh, announces but we see that much later on in the cycle and what we've seen in the past with interest rates as they increase is at the beginning as uh, of the the increase even in 2000 and I believe it was 3 into 2004 5 the interest rates were increasing stock markets increasing real estate increasing and then they plateaued and at that point that they plateaued things had their last push and yeah. then things started to collapse so right. i think that's i think that's what's going to happen this time they might pause i know we've got two sides saying need to go higher need to go lower like, what about pause? What about a pause for 12 months? What about a pause for two months? Yeah. You know, things catch up and everything resets. It's like wages have increased. Think about China as well. Uh, end of last year, the rest of the world's opened up 20, you know, late 2021. China just reopened. And now you're seeing a flood of Chinese um, tourism, which is pushing property prices up, which is pushing uh, hotel prices up. Like everything is going up again. Mm. So that's only just started. And yeah. we're more 
global world now. You know the effects of uh, you know the Chinese tourist in in the UK. We definitely know it here in Australia. It happens in the US, Canada. So one of one of the big things uh, that I look at, or one of the key indicators that I look at, is I tend to focus on the PMIs. And uh, I had uh, TXMC on stream with me last week, and is kind enough to share these charts with me, which are publicly available now. But you can see that Bitcoin generally performs well. Okay, when, when PMIs are going through a phase of expansion, when PMIs are contracting, Bitcoin tends to go in a downtrend. Same happened in twenty uh, in the second in the third in the third epoch, PMIs going lower, Bitcoin going lower. Same again, PMIs tops out, Bitcoin tops out, PMI starts slide, sliding lower, Bitcoin starts sliding lower. So this is just the Bitcoin. Uh, macro cycles versus the manufacturing PMI. And I'm a big fan of the PMIs. It's one of the things that I'm looking for to see when does this bottom out? If growth is slowing down in America, when does it slow down and bottom out and form a trough and start picking up again? Because if we recall what I talked about here, GDP is hard data. It's lagging data. The PMIs are soft data. It's forward looking data. So again, really focusing on the PMIs. And again, another chart that we can look at is Bitcoin cycles follow macro cycles versus high yield corporate credit. Corporate Going back credit, to that PMI, yeah. that, yeah. Just, before you, just before you move on, uh, it's quite interesting that the end of that PMI cycle where it's below the, the dotted line, I think that's at the 50, uh, yeah, the 50 level, Correct, yes. you can see that the Bitcoin cycle has already started to kick up and it's happened again. This period here. Uh, just as it starts to head underneath that fifty, or even on the way down into yeah, that the, fifty, this this was the, COVID see the crash. accumulation. Yeah, this is this is the COVID crash. Even in the red and yeah. the blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Abs absolutely, yeah. So, so again, going through a phase of consolidation, bottoming process, uh, quite a long nine to twelve month, twelve month uh, accumulation. Well, this is this is this is exactly what I was referring to. Mm. I. I for Bitcoin to print a bottom, this is a bottoming phase. I'm not bothered about buying the absolute low. I want to be buying Bitcoin when I know there's a good chance that the probability of growth and PMIs are going to start ticking up. The economy is in, in a good shape. And right now, I don't believe the economy is in good shape. I think there's still some risk to the downside, which could have an impact on markets. Uh, yes, Bitcoin has been in range. What really gives me concern is that this is the first time that Bitcoin is heading in to a recession. So... You know, if 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 the credit spreads are still wide, and we've seen that the, the credit uh, lag effects um, in terms of credit tightening, do I really want to be risk on a Bitcoin at this phase at this price point? No, not necessarily. I'd much rather be willing to wait, um, looking for uh, potentially a soft landing, hard landing, whichever is going to happen, and then start thinking about position. Right, we've seen the worst of the worst, or the, we're heading towards the worst of the worst. Prices are depreciated lower down. Whether Bitcoin holds its lows, is it, who knows? I, I'm not really in this game to say Bitcoin is going to go to new lows or it's going to print a, a higher low. For me, it's all about when is a good time to buy Bitcoin heading into kind of a more bullish market sentiment out there. So looking for the bottom or a bottoming structure on Bitcoin, then shifting my bias and think, okay, this is a good time for me to now really start exposing, exposing my risk appetite into not just Bitcoin and Ethereum, but global markets as well. Sweet. We, we can talk about Bitcoin bottoming patterns, at least the way I see it, yeah. with um, some TA on the macro in a minute. Yeah, sure. This is another interesting chart. That Bitcoin cycles follow macro cycles. So this is Bitcoin versus high yield corporate credit. Again, corporate credit tops out, rolls over, Bitcoin follows suit. Every time uh, corporate credit, you can see uh, in terms of its valuation heading uh, towards this minus one, what does Bitcoin do? It also generally tends to trade lower down. Same again, we saw corporate credit falling off a cliff um, in terms of uh, 2022 and Bitcoin obviously peaking at those levels. So again, just a really fascinating chart to observe to see that, you know what, there actually is um, a dependency or some form of um, correlation with PMIs, with corporate credit. Overall, maybe just Bitcoin is an asset that's driven by global liquidity. It seems to be the case. It trades like a risk on asset. It's a high beta risk on assets, so absolutely. It, when it when it when it when it goes down, it goes down fairly significantly in comparison to equities. When it goes up, it will outp outperform equities and, and the Nasdaq. So it's a great asset to trade and a great asset to invest in as well. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. And that chart to me looks like we've bottomed and potentially coming out of the bottom. What do you see on that chart that tells you that 
we still haven't gone any lower. Because when I look at the green, it looks yeah. like, look, we bottomed and then we're going through an accumulation, which could be a range of 100% or 200% like in 2019. Look at the red. You've got that low point. Then you've got the second low, but basically Bitcoin price had already pushed higher. So for me, the TA on Bitcoin is telling me that it's, it's ready to go up. And then in the blue, um, the blue lines, you know, that already bottomed and it's coming out of it. So to yeah. me, that whole thing looks like we've bottomed and Bitcoin is coming out of that based on the, the high yield, yield corporate credit. That's a valid point, which puts me onto the, the next slide that I'm going to talk about. So basically, this is the 10-year real rates, okay? 10-year real rates, again, bottomed in September, late September, October, November 2021. When real rates rallied, what happened to risk on markets? Got a nice rally. So, so when real rates rallied, equities. Oh, sorry, where are you? My bad. Just oh, twenty twenty one. My bad. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so when, yep. Yeah. So when real rates rallied, equities, Bitcoin traded lower. The key for me is we are now resting at the two thousand eighteen highs on ten year real rates. When we break below this level, I think that is the time to be concerned because that could signal that we are now heading towards a recession. So this is something that I'm watching. If I move forward now onto this chart, this is really fascinating. The blue line is the two's tens yield curve, the two-year, 10-year spread differential. The green line is the PMIs. What's interesting here, this was the late 90s, uh, late 80s. The curve went into inversion, and the yield curve generally, generally leads the PMIs by 6 to 12 months, or you could say the PMIs lag the yield curve by 6 to 12 months. Okay, So when the curve goes through a phase of inversion, you can see the PMIs contracting. The curve comes out of inversion into disinversion, and that's generally a risk-off scenario because as this comes out of inversion into disinversion, PMIs sl slide down even lower. The same happened again in 2001. Curve stayed in inverted for a good period of almost a year. Comes out of inversion, spread differentials, okay? PMIs, slide low down, there's your recession. Same again in 2007, the curve comes out of uh, almost a two-year inversion. PMIs, lagging, six to 12 months later, falls off a cliff. GFC. Same again in, in, in the COVID, um, COVID crash in 2020, a bit of a black swan event. I think it helped speed up events. I believe that the economy was heading into a recession. But obviously with the Fed QE and the events of COVID, curve almost in inversion comes out, PMIs fall off a cliff. What's happened here? The curve is still heavily and deeply inverted, both in terms of depth and duration. When this gets back above the zero level, that's the curve, the spread differential, disinverting. At that point, the expectation is to be risk off because at that point, that tells you that the, the, the belly of the curve, the middle end of the curve is now trading higher than the front end of the curve. And the front end of the curve has approximately around about an 80 to 90% correlation with the Fed's fund rate. That tells you that the Fed funds will probably start cutting rates. Why? Because the economy is weakening and we should see, the, uh, we should see PMI sliding lower down. And at that point, that to me is what I'm waiting for to identify, right? Do you know what? Just as it did in 2008, in 2001, and in the late 80s, maybe once again in 2023 or 2024, we'll have to see. Once this comes down and forms a trough, that to me is a good time for risk on appetite in equities, in stocks, and more appetite into Bitcoin. I'm not saying that Bitcoin won't move. It could move first because with it being a beta asset, but I'm just thinking in probabilities, playing in probabilities. That this is one of the key charts that I'm observing. And, and, and I do believe that the PMIs will eventually slide lower down with growth slowing down in the US economy due to uh, the, the effects of credit tightening. There was one of these charts that I was um, reviewing the other day, uh, especially with this 2 and 10. I know this comes up a lot and I've had a lot of people question, uh, question me about this. If we take it back past the 1980s, um, a little further, at least in, I think it was back to the 40s, somewhere around that period. Anyway, long story short, is that this doesn't always occur. And if it does occur, it's what is that time frame? And in one case, it was 49 months. Once the thing inverted, it was 49 months later that there was a recession. Correct. And so that, yeah, this time, maybe that's one of those times again. It's not a different time. It's just a rhyme of history. And if we do four years out from 
from this point about what 2021 2022 takes us to about 2026 so in terms of a trading opportunity or if, uh, you know a swing trade there's, there's potentially still a lot of upside uh, before this ticks over and i do think we'll see a recession but maybe we saw that recession very briefly in 2020 maybe we saw it in 2022 but it wasn't formally announced so maybe we've seen two recessions in this period that everyone's waiting for another one but it's already happened and so that will start to um the the bears will have to start dragging their feet and then have to get out of their shorts which will then push that market up even higher and, and at that point that's where we get yeah. the collapse when everyone's in in a few years time it's interesting because when we think of rate free premium uh, uh, risk free premium as well you know, if you look at money markets sort of yielding four and a half five percent why not you know there's many large institutions like just part the part of the cash taken out of risk on markets and just bought into um, money markets yielding four or five percent happy days you know so yeah it's, it's, that was it's, like it's, 2004 2005 you're getting some pretty good returns in the bank yeah and then it comes a point where the, the the managers the hedge fund manager or managers of any money they are underperforming the market because now the market is going up 10 percent a year 15 percent a year but they're stuck in mm-hmm. cash getting five or six percent and of course they have to be beating the market otherwise why would you keep your money with them so then everyone starts to pile into the markets which is what pushes it to those final peaks and that is the scary that is the worst time yeah and i don't think I, that's the point that i'll be scared when everyone else is extremely excited whereas right now yeah. everyone's kind of still feeling that bearishness about them where the markets are heading up yeah i i, I think i wouldn't call myself bearish i think i'm i'm optimistically looking forward to lower prices i, th- I think uh especially with the crypto space the time to be bearish is when the credit cycle was starting to tighten. And that was when Bitcoin was like 63K, bond yields were talking, the uh, 10-year real rates were shifting higher, the dollar was moving higher. That was the time to get out of the markets. For people to turn mm-hmm. bearish at, the, at this point, having been bullied for the last two years, like they're playing it completely wrong. It's, it's or now. if they were bearish, like bearish for the last 12 months and still bearish mm-hmm. now. Yeah, and so I, expecting more bearishness. It's like, how long does this? Does, does anyone expect this bearish cycle to go on? So, looking at the Bitcoin monthly chart here, you know, we, we we've had after a significant downtrend, the first real significant bounce. Okay, the 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 issue that I have is if, and I think there's a big probability that over the next six months we could see a downtrend in the markets. I think that's a fantastic buying opportunity, personally, because it it will, in my opinion, form a really good base where, you know, we could see a potential lower high or a higher low or a double bottom before we see a rally heading into the halving once growth expectations increase, once, you know, credit facilitation becomes more freely available in the markets. I don't believe we're going to see an environment where we go back to zero interest rate policy anytime soon. And I think if you look at how markets markets have been fueled throughout the uh, you know, from 20, 2009 all the way through to 2021, it's just been driven on quantitative easing, uh, low rates. Are we really going to see that type of environment over the next four or five years? And I just get, you know, Jason, I just get the impression that global economies around the world are purely driven by QE and money printing. It's just ridiculous. It has turned into a, a Ponzi scheme out of 2000. It really has. And of course, of course, earlier when they took it off the gold standard and everything else back from the 1930s, but even more so lately as we see more and more money come in. And that's part of the banking cycle as well, where we're starting to see more credit come into the markets. People are saying it's tightening because the banks are collapsing, but you start to see governments come out with more and more policy that is helping that first home buyer. I saw it in the UK, I think it was last week or the week before, where they're allowing 100% mortgages. Uh, There are obviously some catches because they're giving you 100%, but these are all just the starts of this next um, liquidity flush into the market. And, you know, that's going to be, it's not going to be nice for those people who are just getting into their first home as we creep up to this peak. And then they're left with a big, uh, you know, big debt in a few years time, I would say. It's fascinating you say that because I feel when governments do that, it's kind of like the last hurdle and it's trapping yeah. so many vulnerable people that they get screwed over so hard when when, when the Agreed. economy collapses and it's like, who's there to support them? They, 
I recall this happening uh, back in 2008, 2009, people defaulting. It was kind of like a last push in the housing market where, go ahead, go on, you know, we'll support you. Uh, go on, take our mortgage. Here's a 95. You take our 95% mortgage, just put 5% down, we'll help you out. And uh, The same thing happened here. We had 107% mortgages, so they would pay for the costs. So you had 100% for the Crazy. mortgage, 7% to pay for the stamp duties and the cost to get in. And it was at the end. And they even allowed you to take out your... Um, uh, I think we're able to use our, uh, what do we call it? Uh, call it superannuation, but basically a retirement fund. So you yeah. could use some of that money as well. And it's like, this is getting too wild. Do you mind if I jump over to a couple of charts or do you want to? Yeah, no, no, go. Things? No, absolutely. Yes, ultimately, when I look at the chart here on the weekly as well, it's like, okay, you know, Bitcoin is in a bullish structure in context of this, but I, I still have to question the validity that, is this really the bottom here? For me, it's not about, price point for me it's more about is this the macro range where all right if equities can't push on from 43 nasdaq is at you know 13.5s bitcoin's up at 30k are many of the charts at high time frame resistance okay bitcoin maybe goes to 32 then what happens if equities rolls over nasdaq rolls over i think there's every possibility that we could come to this lower bound of the range is that bearish absolutely not this is probably where you want to be buying as a as a second opportunity at these macro range lows brilliant buying opportunity if it gets below here then we'll have to talk change plan but as long as you know even if price does come below 15k and reclaims the level that's even more bullish that's a real shakeout if it was to happen again so anything around this region here if we are fortunate to see bitcoin drop back to those levels in the next six months i think this can be a fantastic buying opportunity not something one would should or, or would be bearish about, in my opinion. That that was another point. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll jump over to a couple of charts. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was a point that we we differed on greatly when it came to the Wyckoff schematic. Not saying that everyone has to use yeah. this and only use it. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've got that here. I was looking at this as yeah. part of the, <laughs> the schematic and as it broke out, I'm still seeing this as either a D or an E phase yeah. from that whole drop. Mm. And I think yours starts a little bit earlier. Are you still in that, that same frame where you're saying that this could so, be a B? So you see, spring? yeah, I, I believe so. So if you see where preliminary support is the PS. Yes. And that was that consolidation last uh, um, May, June before the drop off to, you know, 17, yeah. 16K. For me, this is the first retest of PS, which is kind of what you expect in phase B. That move down, you see, you see, because Jason, what's important for me is the selling climax. If you look at the volume on the charts, the selling climax really came during the FTX drop. May was um, Luna UST and then June was the CFI dump. Correct, yes. But I'm looking at basically spot exchanges as opposed to just the uh, Bitcoin index. And for example, when I look at Coinbase, I want to look at the, the volume traded there. That to me, what happened last November 2022 was a real selling climax. You'll see the spike in volume is the same mm -hmm. on the Binance chart. That to me, so just based off volume analysis and volume profile, I think that was a key significant low. If you look at all the other lows and all the other ex major exchanges, it w the selling capitulation volume just wasn't there. That the, the problem is, with the Binance yeah. chart, sorry, mate, sorry, go on. I think that to me is the reason why I've, I've I've depicted November lows as the selling climax. And now this is the first push up into PS. No, I mean, there's still validity there. Obviously, that's your analysis of the Wyckoff and obviously I've got mine. That's yeah, how the yeah. markets work, of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, what we've noticed with Binance was huge volume at that period and now the volume's dropped off. But Binance was doing... Uh, deals to get more spot liquidity onto the exchanges. It was, and it was yeah, it was it, yeah, it was zero like trading fees on spot. Yeah, for yeah. spot markets, it was zero percent. Kind of manipulated, which is why I went to the index, which mm. you know brings it all together. Yeah, but then if you look at Coinbase, Coinbase also spiked, and Coinbase, you know, they shift a fair bit of uh, Bitcoin on a this daily is my basis. Coinbase chart here. I think it might be a bit messy. Yeah, so we got a pretty high volume there, and then FTX, I see, is the final washout. And because yeah. the market, I mean, look, my, my view, of course, uh, with all, course, all due yeah. respect and that sort of stuff, yeah. the market just didn't have the strength to go any lower. So it was almost like that was it. That was the final capitulation from the bears with yeah. the worst 
the worst news the market could have or crypto Bitcoin market can have. And from that point, the, the price was just not able to get any lower. Okay, you could say it went an extra $52 lower. But on the, on the scheme of things, it's not that big of a deal. And then from that point, it's off to the races and a breakout of this um, significant double top. And I guess I looked at that May dump as the test here in August before we had the rejection, final dump, another test here in February. And then on this significant, like this, sorry about all the lines. Um, let me bring up this index chart again. This dump here, that was the banking crisis low. So whenever I put together like major news events that shock the market and that freak the market out, and then the market takes off from that point, I typically view that as a very significant low and one that will probably not be broken. Um, just from what I've seen in the past, say like, you know, the COVID dump, that was such a, uh, such an extreme dump and it shocked the world and everyone was expecting a lower move from that point. They were expecting bigger recession. This was the collapse and it just didn't happen. So we've got this big move away from that low point. And it happens quite often, obviously on the S&P 500 and, and other, other major markets. So that's why I'm looking at this March as not, uh, as an area that the market won't break down. And if it was to break down, we're in bigger trouble than just a, a normal accumulation yeah. zone for BTC. I've got a question for you, Jason. What do you think of the correlation between global liquidity, equities, and Bitcoin? Because there is certainly a correlation there. Yeah, I, I agree. I definitely see that um, the correlation with, you know, there's more money coming into the markets. Therefore, yeah. there's going to be more money coming into riskier assets. And of course, stock market, risk on, Bitcoin, risk on. But if yeah. the Fed goes through a phase of pausing and liquidity becomes even more constrained and tighter over the next six months, would you perhaps say that could be a concern for risk on assets like equities and Bitcoin then if we go through a period of tighter liquidity? So one of the charts that I track is global is the Fed net liquidity indicator, which uh, there's a very tight correlation between Bitcoin and the Fed net liquidity indicator. It's, it's very closely correlated for most parts of the last 12, 18 months. So over the last several weeks, I've just seen liquidity fall lower down. Um, liquidity did get a massive injection up from October through to February. Uh, liquidity slowed down at the highs of March and April. Um, and as a result, I, I just feel as though we're stalling in, in, in risk on assets. Uh, I'm just trying to understand where is the next bout of liquidity, liquidity going to come from, given the fact that central banks around the globe are going through a phase of further tightening, which could very well be the case. And I don't think we're going to see a case where we're going to see a Fed cut anytime soon in the next two, three months. Yeah, I, I definitely take your point. And I see that's why you know many people are sort of wondering what's going to happen next. I tend to follow the chart more so than anything, regardless of, say, like what macro events are happening. I, I tend to look at the macro events as, oh, that's the reason for what has already happened on the chart. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess maybe I'm... Uh, maybe more a more purist TA where I just focus on the chart and then those things help explain what happened later on. Because um, if I go across to the S&P, you know, this is what we're both seeing. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm saying it's a transitional period and you've called it a, a trading range. It's essentially exactly, it is a trading range of between 42 and 35 or 3,600 points. More recently, 3,800 points. We just keep putting in higher and higher lows on increasing volume every time we have a banking collapse. You know, this was the major banking crisis. That's extreme volume at that low and the market's moved away from that point. And then all through this range, uh, I think even this little area here of March was uh, further regional banks collapsing. So we had more regional banks collapsing here, more volume coming into the low. We had more regional banks collapsing here, more volume coming in, more regional banks collapsing, more volume, price moved to the upside. So this isn't really the concern for me so far. This is the big one here that I want to see hold mm -hmm. around that 3,800. Yeah, fair but, enough. Um, fair point. Which, yeah. which it should, if it's respect to market structure, you'd expect those laws to hold, essentially. But the, the yeah. question is, what, what happens if you see price take out that low? I would say there's something wrong. Something bigger is happening. Something bigger that we don't know about now. So everything we know about now, I think, is already yeah. Yeah. here. 
Because we both mm. understand six months forward, plan, you know, they, they price in a lot of things, but there'll be something bigger if that happens. I, I don't think it's going to happen yet. I think we still have that, that upside to come. But, um, you know, if that happened, I, I don't know what it would be. It's not going to be anything we know about. Um, okay, that's, that's, that's a fair comment. But I think even if it does happen, I think one has to look forward to the potential opportunity of buying uh, stocks lower down, equities, indices lower down, and potentially Bitcoin mm-hmm. as well for that matter. So again, it's it's a case where, is it really time to be bearish? I don't think so. I think we're both on the same page with that. Well, we don't see it as a, a bearish time because we're more interested in buying as right. opposed to, you know, as opposed to selling in the bearish period, you know, these, these areas back here are probably better to be selling, obviously. And even, even into the peak, like I'd rather be bearish running into the peak than, yeah. you know, than, than trying to be buying all the way up to the top. Yeah. Um, NASDAQ is quite similar as well. If I just move over to that chart, I've just labeled in some of the major, uh, you know, the major events back in, 2021, you know, Evergrande collapsed. And then from that point, everyone's expecting the world to implode, but we're almost back to those levels. If we look at it in terms of a percentage, mm. you know, we're only about 6% away from that point where it doesn't seem like much now, but you remember the news at the time, like that was, if China went down, the world had to go down because there was so many uh, funds invested in China. You know, that was the narrative back then. But, um, you know what we see now is the is the Nasdaq continuing to push to higher and higher prices. We've yeah. literally just had a highest yearly daily close. What's your thoughts on the market breadth? So the Nasdaq is <clears throat> literally carrying the, the the large three four stocks are carrying the rest of the market. There's a massive breadth divergence between you know all the low caps and the Russell two thousand and, and the Nasdaq. Is that of concern? Yes. That if we Not were to see an if we were to see an earnings recession. Would that change your your opinion? I, I I don't think so at this stage, only because of what we're seeing on the chart and the breadth itself. And over the long term, when we're looking at the um, uh, the chart itself, I think I, I just posted and talked about this on a YouTube video recently. The long term, those small cap tech stocks are on a downtrend over the last forty years, so it's not really a good indicator of. Well, a few stocks are carrying the market, the rest are dumping. It's kind of like cryptocurrency. The majority of altcoins are garbage. Like why would those altcoins be carrying the crypto market? They're all garbage. It's the same thing in tech. You have a few good cryptos that carry the market, Bitcoin, call it ETH if you want to, maybe one or two others, but the rest of it's garbage and it has to go to zero. So it's the same thing in the in the tech space with the breadth, meaning, you know, if anyone doesn't understand it, you got you got those few the differences between those high, um, high, um, uh, high caps and the, the low caps, the large caps, small caps, those ones are carrying it. You've got the, you know, the apples, which are stronger. Um, Amazon's coming back. I think it's just getting past its 50% now, bounced after, uh, past its 50% level. So these are my major ranges that I look for for strength and weakness. It's from those cycle points, that 2001 low to the 2021 high, and then it's bounced off 50 and it's coming back from there and so on. So you're going to have a few great companies that carry it and the rest of them all just going to die. So I, I'm not concerned about that. I think it's one of those things that has, it has been a narrative and eventually that narrative will die. So I think it's fair to say that neither of us are bearish, that if the market goes lower, we're both looking to become buyers. I think the only objective difference here is you believe that, you know, we, 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 we could see continued upside. My argument is that I think there's a possibility we could see downside but the beauty of it is that we're both looking to become buyers. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's yeah. just it's just unfortunate that the markets have been in this massive macro range for the best part of one year, which has got everybody flipping bullish, bearish, bullish, bearish, instead of just trading yeah. what's ahead of them. It's like, come on, guys, this, this is just a range. Environment it's a bit or, of, yeah. Yeah, 13 months in, yeah. in this range here from April of last year. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, the, the other thing I look at, I don't know if you if you check these as well, is the home builders. ETF. Yes, I do check the home, build, home builders uh, charts, the home builders surveys, and look at the uh, new home builds versus sold uh, sold houses and um, manufacturing of uh, housing materials as well, just to get an eye or insight what's really happening in the housing economy. But I only focus on the US markets, if I'm honest with you, Jason. You probably focus on not just the US, but the markets across the globe as well. Yeah, taking the lead from the US because that's obviously yeah. where the most money is. 
uh, and then it sort of flows into the UK, Canada, Australia, Singapore, Germany. Um, it's all it's all relevant. And with the 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 US uh, the home builders here ETF, uh, again, this is leading the market, showing the strength in the market where we have June as a low, October as the higher low. Whereas we go to the S and P, we had the June low, then the October lower low. Yeah. So the home builders are really um, they're leading the market here and pushing past their 50% level. So they're halfway point getting past their lows back in 2021. Whereas the S and P, the same area is all the way, uh, back at these zones right here. And then these lows. So we're getting close to it, but the home builders are really showing that they're at least the investors, the, the funds are seeing the profits coming through for the home builders. And this is basically the, you know the the crux of the of the economy is is the real estate. So once yeah. this starts to top over, I'm going to be very very scared. But for now, we still have a fair bit to go. We saw that in 2006. You can see the peak, the lower top into 2007, another lower top in 2007, and we know in 2007 the S and P 500 uh, peaked in October in that peak 2007, and bottomed in March. Whereas we go to the home builders. You can see it was already down in April 2008 and started to bottom in November, putting in a higher low after yeah. uh, the market was bottoming. So it's really like a, a leading index here. So this thing is is very strong above 50%, very strong above another 50% level, putting in higher lows, higher highs, yeah, huge sure. volume coming in at the lows. So this this is probably one of the, this is one of those major things where I'm not concerned with the the market yet. Uh, there's still plenty of upside, but we both agree there's going to be a major reset, a major collapse. I just think it's got a few more years rather than this year or 2024. Again, just looking at this chart, at which point would you be concerned that there could be downside risk in the next three to six months? What level would As, have to be? What's your level of invalidation to say, you know, there's a good chance that Bitcoin could could come back down to 15K again? Bitcoin or the real estate cycle? So, so, so looking at this, if this on this chart here, what would be your immediate level of validation? Uh, I know you're more oh. of a positional player, a trader, a high time frame positional player, but I'm just talking about like over the next three to six months, which low would give you concern? Short term, if we can take it as short yeah. as possible. And of course, yeah. we know when we, when we go as short as possible, we leave ourselves exposed to, to bigger, uh, you know, bigger changes. But of course, this one here, March in yeah. the 13th back that huge volume when the banks all collapsed that that would be pretty concerning to me but if you want to take it you know technically speaking there's your june low if the market starts to consolidate under 55 and 51 consolidate not wicks but consolidate under that level that's where i'll be concerned but um yeah how, now, how, how would you position if that was the case what would you do would you go risk off definitely be getting some cash ready yeah and then and then I think that would take a lot longer. You know, this this downtrend would be a lot longer than what we've seen here over the last um, 12 months going from, oh, this was even shorter, sorry, December to June was only a six-month downtrend for the home builders. That would be my concern. And now we're sort of heading up. I think we'll probably creep slowly up, maybe consolidate here and just continue to the slow grind up. The 0.5 level that you've currently got mapped out, mapped out it's around about the 68 level. Yeah, the that, 69. Would, would that give you some short term concern, or you'd be like, it's, it's probably just a corrective wave? Just a corrective at this point. Like, I'm yeah. a bit more concerned with the low. If I bring out my uh, my swing chart, that's I'm more concerned with that low and these lows back here, which are under this 50%. So, I'm more concerned with these. This for now, it should hold. But if it doesn't, I'm more concerned with this. Yeah. What could you say? We're on a similar page. However, it's just the timing. I think I was. Yeah. I, I think our short-term projections vary, but I think we both agree that over a long enough time period, um, it's probably going to be a good opportunity to buy. But it's what one's perception is of what is a good price. You know, that's what the, the exactly. markets are there for. You know. And I think that's what I got from your analysis was that you're waiting on a few more signals or you're waiting to see a few more things before you become a, a little more, I, I don't know, bullish on the whole thing yeah um, essentially you're waiting yeah you're waiting to see a few more signs whereas i guess from my end i think i've seen the signs that i need to see and i'm willing to take that risk a little bit earlier on um you know for bitcoin you know there's still a few more levels that we could see further up get taken out mm. but um i guess i'm not as concerned because we've seen 
we've seen almost enough at this stage. And what, when I factor in the home builders, the um, where the stock markets are at, then I think we're probably got enough to go to the upside on Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, we've covered quite a lot of things here where I'm looking at the log downtrend has already been broken, bounced heavily off that log downtrend as well. That's a big one for me. And then yeah. breaking out of that double top. Uh, you know, when a signal fails, we know it's a signal within itself. So I'm qu- I'm quite quite bullish on BTC. I, I don't think we should see prices below 20k. Do you think the lows are in that good case? Of I lows? think this is the low. I think the 15 and a half k is the low. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we should see under this low here, 19 and a half, 20k. Yeah. What probability would you give it that that particular level holds from a probability oh. point of view? <laughs> Well, we're, 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 51% is good enough. <laughs> 51%. Uh, when I say that, it's like, we know in Bitcoin, wicks happen, but it's yeah. more like, is the market going to break and hold under those levels? That's Correct. really what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm referring to as well um, in terms of acceptance below the level. Yeah, not. I mean, a wick's a wick in crypto. Like You yeah. see that all the time What on, on, the, on the Binance chart. You can see wicks like that from December. They come all the way down to eight grand. Do you remember that? That was just stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks Thanks again for having a chat. Um, lots of views there. I know it brings out the, the macroeconomics, looking at some of those other charts and you know, getting a, a different view of the markets. And I'm glad we're able to have a pretty yeah. uh, adult conversation, I think some people like to call it. No, I think I think everybody's uh, entitled you know, to write this sort of their own views. And I think that's the beauty of it, when we can jump on stream and just talk about the differences of opinion. But overall, truth be told, we're not bearish. I'm just cautious. I'm just being very, very cautious, whereas you're probably more optimistic than I am. I think that's probably the differentiating factor here. But, uh, I think that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We have the timing at the end of the cycle, and then also you're waiting on a few more signals, whereas I'm like, all right, I think it's yeah. time. I want to get as low as possible. Yeah, yeah you've, you've, I, certainly got, you've certainly got a higher risk appetite than I have, so <laughs> fair play to you for that. All good. Guys, thank you very much for tuning in with XO and myself. Uh, depending on where you're watching this, let us know in the comments section, whether, whether you're on XO's channel or, or mine. I'll have all the links to XO stuff. He may or may not have my links on his channel. We'll see. But other than that, <laughs> <laughs> we'll sort something out, Jason. We will be back, I think, in the next couple of months, see where this, uh, where this is all played out. Do you think the market's going to be higher than where it is now by the end of the year? S&P and Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin's at 27. S&P is at 4,100. Do you think it'll be higher at the end of the year or lower? I think the end of the year is still such a long time away, but right. I think there's a probability, a good enough probability that we could go lower and then maybe pop back up to this level where we're at 27, 28K in six months time. A lot can happen, Jason, between now mm. and six months. Six months in crypto is a hell of a long time, um, given the volatility that we see. So I still believe there's a chance that Bitcoin could retest 20k, 18k, 16k, maybe at a push 14k, but it, it's not going to be long before it rockets back up to 30k again because of the risk appetite and the 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 just the general um, sentiment and general speculation in Bitcoin really pushes it higher very very quickly. Because you you've seen it, we've both seen it. Once Bitcoin gets going, bloody hell, there's no stopping it. Is there? There really isn't. I'll say that I think it. Of course, you guys probably know my opinion. I think it's definitely going to be higher s p and bitcoin will be higher than where they are now and you know for the record just was a fun game that we can play because i don't know we're adults and we're dgens at the same time bitcoin's at twenty seven thousand, and s p 500 is at 41 so yeah i think it'll be higher somewhere around november december thanks everyone peace out